Rejoice! Emmanuel has come. Indeed, we give God thanks for that fact. And I think that the church should be in celebration mode. For we are celebrating the birth of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are celebrating the one who has granted us salvation. We have celebrated the one who has fulfilled all the gamut of history and uh, scripture. And so we rejoice. Emmanuel has come. Let us celebrate the King of Kings, for he has indeed come to us. This morning I want to speak to you as we reflect on the topic, In the Fullness of Time. I want to reflect on that with, with us as we seek to bring our attention and our focus on the purpose, the reason, and the fulfillment of the Messiah's story. And as I reflected with you on Sunday, we spoke of the mission of God, the Messiah Day, the God-planned salvation for mankind, and how God has woven His plan in history, and how God had spent the time to use His servants of all his prophets and his priests and those who communicate or communicated his message throughout history and we have the scripture to back to back that fact that god has been speaking about a plan he has for us in light of our state in light of our predicament in light of how far we have gone from him. God by character. And in this Christmas season as we talk about God is love. For God so loved the world. We see that in that love. God manifested his plan through history to us. And so I want to. Focus on that as we go through this morning to talk about how God has brought his plan to fruition. Eat, drink and be merry. The world is splurging in its ferry. Forgetting the reason they should making no room for the psaltery. A psaltery to play the true Christmas melody. When will we see the Christmas is really not about the Mass, but about the Christ in the Mass? When will we find sobriety and arise from the drunken mental malady? For to be lost so long is a testament to the fact that we have lost Christ in the mass of Christmas. May it be that we arise from the state that we are in and that Christ will shine on us this Christmas. I want to use that as a platform before we go into the text, Galatians 4 verse 4 and 5, which we will focus on. Just to recall how much we have lost our bearings and how much we have lost our attention on this grand plan that God has orchestrated through history and brought to fulfillment in the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. How much we have not paid attention to the signs, to the fact that we miss all the signs that really points us to Christ. Let me show you how quick we miss the signs. For when the testimony of the coming of Jesus came to bear on Mary and on the three wise men, I want to say that one of the signs that was said in Matthew is that the sign of the king is swaddling and rags. That the king is not recognized because the king did not come in wealth and riches. And so we tend to miss the signs of God's working. Because it seems simple to 
Well, we tend to fall asleep on the facts. Whenever we should be paying close attention to what God is doing. And that is why when the history unfolds itself in scripture, the very people who should know the coming of Christ could not recognize the coming of Christ. That even when the message of the wise men came to Jerusalem and Herod heard, Herod asked the priest to unfold the history of scripture so that they can understand what is the signs or what are the signs of the Messiah's coming. And I want to say that God tend to surprise us. For in the fullness of time, God comes on his own terms. And God comes on his own terms. And he chooses when and where to show up and show out. And this is what has been happening. And so I want us to pay close attention to how God has fulfilled his plan. For if we don't pay that attention, we will miss the whole story together. And our Mary will not be on Christ. So I reflected on Sunday to talk about how God planned this salvation and how God shows us that it is through this promise made to Abraham that he will bring about a blessing, a blessing for all men. And God who always takes the lead for God is a covenant-keeping God, and God is a God who does, who does not go back on his word. So God takes the lead, and we can have confidence in what God says, for as I said Sunday, what God says he will do. He will do. And so God promised Abraham that out of him, the blessing of all people will come. God, we, rem we are reminded, is true to his word and he accomplishes what he says we also are reminded that God has said and has carried all this that he has said to benefit us who are privileged to hear and participate in what he has done and we are also affirmed when he said to Abraham I am your reward that God is trustworthy, that God is sovereign and he rules sovereign in his plan. So what he had planned in the beginning of time, he worked that plan out by his rule and reign. He brought it to fruition. And more so, God is doing all of that that he's doing in a kind of kindness toward us. That God is kind enough to ensure that he extend that graciousness that we can participate in what he is doing. So we are alongside God because God is kind enough to come alongside us. We are a part of God's great plan because God by nature is of his love and God by nature in his kindness communicates that to us. And causes us to share in his fellowship. For remember, all of what God is doing is as a result of who God is. And as a result of what we have done to offend him. We have violated him. But because of God's nature and character, he is doing what he is doing. And what he is doing is as a result of what we have done. And so in that, we are seeing God's kindness at work and through history and to bring about a plan to save us, to redeem us, to take us up out of our state. And so God meticulously orchestrates history and God climax his work, his mission in the coming of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, in light of this Christmas time and in light of the birth of Jesus, Paul is reflecting on how much God has been doing through history. And so if you have the time when you go home or wherever, spend some time to read through Galatians.
Galatians chapter 3. And we'll see how Paul connects the Old Testament, the, the concealed message or the mystery of the gospel. For I want to say that this gospel we preach was bounded up in the same simple plan that God had said to Abraham. That through you all nations will be blessed. The gospel message is in that. It is a part of what God is doing. And so God climaxed his story. And God climaxed his work. In the birth of Jesus Christ. The ultimate gift. As we call it. The Messiah has come. And so... To redeem the story. has done. I want us to know that what Paul was interacting with Is it Is was it a time when, when the gospel story, message was right, so look, simple look, look up, was look up, undermined by look up, those who believed. Right. Paul look up, was look writing up. to the churches in Galatia. And what God, what Paul was saying is that because they were imposing circumcision on the message of the gospel, it undermines what Jesus has done. It undermines the reach and the effect of the gospel. For those who were Jews, ascribe circumcision plus belief in order to be saved. And Paul, in a rebuttal, Paul, in an apology, a defense of the gospel, says if anyone should preach another gospel, than what Christ has done or what the gospel means, let him be a curse. For what God has done in Jesus Christ is offer this gift that is free to us and no addition should be put to it. And Paul was responding to that. And Paul outlines in the whole story as he, as he interacts. In his defense, he spoke about Abraham and how through Abraham the seed was promised and how God in time through history has brought this promise to fulfillment. Paul gives a backstory in the very text that I focused on on Sunday, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5, which Paul makes it clear that there's a righteousness that God requires. And that righteousness is only attained by what? By what? Faith. And so Paul is using the argument put in Genesis chapter 15. For Abraham did not have to obey any rule or righteousness, which is the merit of God. Abraham received righteousness because Abraham do you know what? He believed what God said. He believed what God said. And that righteousness, Paul is making it clear that if and when we respond like that to God, we are children of Abraham. For like Abraham, we are believing God. We are believing God. And so, Paul highlights that. And Paul is connecting the history of the Jews and bringing it up to the time when Christ came. And so Paul moved from that point. And in verse 14 of chapter 3, Paul says, He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. 
so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And that is what we are seeing God is do we are seeing God doing through time. You know. God is working his plan out. And when Jesus comes, that is when the time of faith comes to bear on us. And so we must now see that our redemption is as a result of Jesus' coming. And that is the blessing, the same blessing that Abraham received. It's the same blessing that we are sharing in. The same blessing of the firstborn child. We who are not, we who are outcasts, we who are the other nations are sharing in the first class citizen blessing. Because of Jesus' coming. Because of what he has done for us. Paul wants us to remember as we commemorate the coming of Christ that this is the fulfillment of the promise made thousands of years ago to Abraham. And it continues to remind us of the faithfulness and character of God who brings all of his plan to, to fruition. That Christ came for the purpose of redemption, restoration, and reconciliation. I want us to hold that close to us as we come to the Christmas season. For the benefit of Christ is so much more significant than what we can put in our physical bodies. We should understand that Christ's action has benefit for personal reconciliation and public unity. That when Christ comes to us, Christ restores our souls. Christ gives life to us. The coming of Christ is life and light. John says it, the, the light has shone in the darkness. And the darkness could not comprehend it. For Christ came to give us life. That is what we are celebrating today. I had talked about how the angels sung in heaven and they heard it on earth on Sunday. I want to say they know what Christ was about. And so the celebration and the excitement and the grandeur experienced by these shepherds and Mary and Joseph and the animals with them is a sign of history that God was doing something wonderful something great and glorious for the benefit of us all. May we hold firm in that as we come in this Christmas season. As we celebrate today that we don't miss the point as we tend to do a lot of times. In verse 22 of chapter 3 of Galatians, Paul puts it this way when he was reflecting. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe so the mystery of Christ in the Old Testament was hidden it could not be grasped for the very the length of time and the breadth of time that ex, that was there and more than that it was the power of sin that help people or cover the eyes of people to understand what God was doing. And that is even evident today. For a lot of times people ask where is God? And what is happening? And a lot of times we are blinded by the realities that are around us. But God is still at work. God is still redeeming his people through the work of Jesus Christ. It's not a, it's not, we, we only see when we are looking to God through the eyes of faith and we understand what God is doing through history even though the times seem like they are going backward or to the dark ages. For even the time when we think God is absent, God is very much present. Paul is bringing to bear on this fact that sin has control and has so, so much power that it, 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 it blinds those who are supposed to see the light of truth. 
Paul referenced God's work that it came to fruition and it came to fulfillment in the coming of Christ. So Paul ensured that he talks about that in chapter 3. And when I come to the text that I'm focusing on this morning, the two verses, Paul is communicating to us that the coming of Christ is the fulfillment and the answer to human problem. While at the same time, Paul is giving a rebuttal to the views of the Jews who ascribe exclusivity to God as their own preference and benefit. That they alone have a grasp on God. Paul is saying no. Paul is making sure that we understand that exclusivity to God is as a result of our belief in his son. It's as a result of understanding the purposes for which Jesus came. And so Paul said, in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, remember I worked out the whole slate of the history of, of the scriptures, talking about how God planned it through Genesis, how we come to Numbers and God made a plan about it. Deuteronomy, God made a plan about it. In Judges, God tried, God used the Judges to bring about some form of redemption. However, the Judges were insignificant. The prophets tried to bring about the law in such a way that a restoration should happen, but that wasn't enough. And more than that, God was depending on man. For if you bring your mind back to Noah, we were supposed to be destroyed. And God saw Noah. And even Noah's state, who is a type of Christ, was not sufficient to bring about redemption for mankind. You know what God did? God said, I will go myself. I will do what no one else can do. I will step down from my place. You want to hear the Carmen Christie of Scripture for our Philippians chapter 2? He who was equal to God did not count equality as an advantage, but he humbled himself. He took on himself sinful flesh. Me and you. He became nothing. He came and pitched his tent amongst the worst of the worst. The God of all creation has done that for me and you. The God of love. The God who is transcendent above all else. Has become evident and present in our midst. So when we celebrate the coming of Christ, we are talking about the incarnation, the enfleshment of Jesus to come and dwell amongst those who are his enemies. And has communicated love so that we can become his friends. That's what Jesus has done. When we think about the coming of Christ, Paul said, when the fullness of time has come, spoke it, Speaking about how God is in control. Remember I talk about his sovereignty and rule. That nothing happens outside of his purview and control. When the fullness of time has come. And if we reflect on that a little bit. We see that Israel was at a state of unrest. And unease. And that Israel as a religious movement was in hypocrisy to the point that those who are responsible for the scriptures, the professors, the experts in the law were manipulating the law for their own benefit. We see that the political plight of Israel, they were in bondage by the Roman Empire. The rebels were present and occupying the land. The people 
were lost because they did not have a shepherd to guide them. You can imagine just like how it is happening now that a sense of crime and violence was present that anything goes on there was not any moral fiber anymore. It's as though the times and the state of times was worse or was at its full or was at an increase to the point where Jerusalem was overflown by the shedding of innocent blood. <laughs> and when we look at our human state and how we are at the time when it's like, it's like sin has reached its neck height. And at its worst time, and when you look at our own state, we see that there is a need that we have. <laughs> Imagine at that time you are in Israel, and the state that it was in, that no one could enter the very temple of God without being marginalized or undermined for they could not buy a simple sacrifice to account for their sins. It's as though the time was at its worst. But I want to say just as much as I'm making the point that in the fullness of time Paul says God and not us. That even when we are at our worst, it's not that that dictates to God what to do. But God has preordained the coming of Christ at his own appointed time. That the advent we are reflecting on is as a result of God. And God's response. God saw this move. Before time began. God knows what was going to happen before time began. God made a provision for the state that we are in before time began. And God brought that in a real sense to the experiences of his people. When God showed up, God showed up. God came at the time that was appointed by him. And I want to say, God got no slight things, you know, because the coming of Christ or the second advent is as similar as the first. For Christ talks about his second coming as one that so suddenly will surprise many. The unreadiness of the religious sect. The unreadiness of the political sect. The unreadiness of the people on a whole. But God still come. Yes. That's the kind of reflection that we should understand when we think about the fullness of time. God is in charge of time. God controls and moves through history and time and shows up when he wants at his appointed time God willed it to happen and that is what we should reflect we, we, we are seeing a God at work that shows his character on the, play, the pages of history and we should always celebrate that is this the kind of God that we serve when we talk about God knowing all things we should celebrate that when we talk about his character, we should celebrate that. When we know that, you see, when we go through our test of times, when we go through our own personal things and issues, and we understand that God is in control, we can soar on heights. We can know that God will make a provision. We can know that God will come through at his appointed time. Mary, in Mary's song. I wanted to reflect on Mary's song. Mary 
just looked on her lowly estate and says, you reward the lowly. You turn away the rich with their pride. You come alongside her, unworthy of a woman, but she's blessed by history. Because God sees, God knows, and God come true for his people. Paul not only said that in the fullness of time that testifies about God's control of history and time and his sovereign and in charge. But God says, God sent forth his son at that appointed time. God sent his son. And in the real sense of the word, it's like God came himself. In fact, that is what happened. God came himself. So when we talk about the birth of Christ, we see that God, who is grand, makes the divine in this simple baby laid in a manger. God compresses the grandeur of himself in a little baby. God show up on his own terms. When we reflect then on the coming of the Son of Christ, we can't miss the purpose of his coming. For in the text read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it talks about how the Son of God and the angel testifies to Joseph. And he says that this child will do what? Will save his people. What had blinded the people for so long? From their sins. This child will save his people from their sins. Jesus' is coming meant so much to them. And Jesus' is coming means so much to us. For it is what we needed for so long. And we could not provide it for ourselves. But God accomplished what he has planned from before time begun in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we celebrate the coming of Christ like that. May we keep at the forefront of our minds the purposes of his coming. Paul is showing us that there is evidence of Jesus' is coming that it is full and free. That Jesus' is coming represents for us a coming alongside us. The incarnation itself means for us that. That Christ coming means that he is establishing himself with us. He became the son of man and he lived the perfect life in a time when people were obligated to the Lord, which did not attain for them life, but the law was a burden to them. For by the Lord, no one can be saved. And by the Lord, no one can obtain to righteousness. And the law by itself was, as Paul puts it, a guardian until Christ was revealed. That's a beauty, you know. That's a beauty. And more than that, it's not just the law of Moses. For we are a law unto ourselves who don't know the law of God. That itself we cannot attain to. We set our principles for ourselves. And we fall short at the very principles that we set for ourselves. We are inadequate. And Jesus came at the right time. For he came at that time when the law was in charge. And in his demonstration of life, he lived perfectly. The sinless life. Paul is showing us also that Jesus' is coming means for us liberation and freedom. So Paul said it. 
that Christ came under the law to redeem those who are under the law. So Christ's coming is of full benefit to us. And I hope we ensure that we, we, get, we catch a, a, a glimpse of that. That Paul reminds us that God superintends all that happens. That even at man's climax, or the climax of man's sin and unrest, today for us is a glorious day. Today for us, or the Christmas period, or the reflection of the birth of Christ, is a glorious day. I don't know if you're familiar with the name glorious day. In the first verse, it says one day when heaven was filled with his praises. One day when sin was as dark as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin. Dwelt amongst men. Our example is he. It ends by saying, living he loved us. Dying he saved us. Buried he carried our sins far away. And rising he justified. And we are freely forgiven. And again he's coming. Another glorious day. This is why we celebrate. This is why we represent God, how we represent God in our times. The goodness of God that we are experiencing. When we celebrate and we give gifts in the spirit, when we set up our houses, when we look for our family, when we cook the good food, when we reflect on our history and we were singing some earlier, the well one of our cultural songs and we are talking about Christmas and the joy of Christmas. The glory is on Christ. It is about Him. The centrality of Christmas is Christ. And the reason for that is because he has attained for us freedom that we so need. We were lost in our state. But Jesus has accomplished his work. I don't want to belabor it because I can divulge a little more. <laughs> but I want to say that whenever we reflect on Christmas, ensure that we keep the truth of Christmas at front and center. Ensure that we testify of the goodness of Christ. That at this period of time, it's not just in the prolet, as it is in the Christ. Upon the mountain, in a the valley, round a country, and the gully side, go and go tell everybody, say Jesus born. In a the school yard, Rona Gaza, on the gully side, go and go tell everybody, say Jesus born. Jesus born, Messiah born, Messiah born.
We praise God for his work. John 1 verse 18 says, No man has seen God at any time. But the Son, but the Son, who is from the Father, has made him known to us. God bless his words. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a word that has been brought to our hearts this morning. We give God thanks for how he has been inspiring our brother, Pastor Kabon, and on Sunday and this morning, just to hear from a different perspective. Uh, and that we can reflect again and that by His Spirit He has brought us into this reflection of the reason for the season not to be lost among the masses but Christ is effective in the Mass all right, and the focus of the Mass and we thank God for that that in his time he acted when everything was topsy-turvy he came amen and we want to talk about that we want to continue to reflect on that because many of us even in our situations we are groaning we are waiting with anticipation there are some things that we may be going through. This Christ and this God who acted in his time will also act on our behalf in his time, not in our time. Sometimes we set up an agenda for God and say, God need to do it now. But our now is not necessarily God's now. Amen? Can we reflect on that? That's what jumped at me when our brother was speaking. That sometimes we set some schedules for God. But God's schedule and our schedule are not necessarily the same. But what we are confident of is that He acts in His time. He acts on our behalf. Amen? And we're going to sing this final hymn of reflection thou this leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me but in bethlehem's soul was there one no for thy whole activity oh come to my heart lord jesus there is room in my heart for thee today if you should hear his voice harden not your heart but open up yourselves to him and say, There is room in my heart for thee. Let's stand together.
says, Thou camest, O Lord, with a living word that should set thy people free. And I wonder today if there are some persons who need to be set free today. There may be some things that are weighing you down and challenging you. But Christ came for that. The word says he came to set the captive free. Amen. And I wonder if there are some persons who need us to pray for them this morning before we close this service. That this Christ that we talk about is no longer a babe in a manger. But he's here to meet us at our point of need. He's here to set us free from those things that have us, have us bound. Amen? And I want to pray for somebody this morning. We want to pray with you this morning. As we sing these two final stanza, will you come? Will you come and give your heart to, to the Lord? Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. The last uh, refrain says, My heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest for me. What if Christ should come now? Will our hearts rejoice? That's the question. So as we close the service, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if he should make his appearing now, your heart cannot rejoice. Only if you, prior to now, receive him as Lord and Savior for your lives. But some may be cast down, burdened down. He came to set the captive free. That's what we want to pray for every heart that is troubled this morning. Let's respond as we sing these two final verses. The famous the Lord with the living word I should say Because we are joyful of the fact that you sent your only begotten Son into this world to redeem us who were dead in our trespasses and sin. And as the prophet says, that you came to set the captive free. Thank you that there is freedom in the Christ of Christmas. Thank you that there is life and light in the Christ of Christmas. Thank you God that even though we could not comprehend it and even though 
we were at a desperate state and wondering what would happen. Thank you that even when we did not recognize it, you had a plan and you fulfilled that plan in the fullness of time. Thank you, God, for what you have done in Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you that even in our own lives, oh God, there are things that we are going through, things that are happening to us from years coming on that we cannot understand it. Things, oh God, that, Lord, we are seeking you about. But we thank you that this Christ is still available to us, O oh God. And in the fullness of time, you shall reveal it to us. In the fullness of time, you shall deliver. Thank you, O oh God, that this is what Christmas re represents for us. And God, we praise you and we worship you, O oh God, that it's not pegged on our own agenda, not on our own schedule, but God, in your time, O oh God, you make all things new. God, we thank you and we praise you for this word. We worship you, O God, and we lift you up. God, if there are those who are going through difficulties at this time, some are even depressed, and just staring into space. I pray, O oh God, that you will be with such a one now. And give hope to that hopelessness, we pray. That even as they reflect on you, the true meaning of Christmas, that, Lord, they will be hopeful. They will rejoice even in the midst of their difficulty. Lord, I pray for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that even in this season, they will come to a saving knowledge of you. We give you thanks for all that you have done. We thank you, God, for your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you, God, that you have covered our lives even throughout this year. That, Lord, you have provided in many ways for us in this year. And, God, we just worship you and give you all the glory and the praise that belong to you. So, God, even as we go from this place, I pray, O oh God, that you will go with us wherever we go. Whether we are traveling to the country or whether we are gathering in our homes, we pray, O oh God, that in the midst of it, you will be very present. And that, Lord, we will continue this conversation of the Christ of Christmas. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace and joy both now and forevermore. And the church say, Amen. 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 Just to remind you that watch night, sir, well, we start, we have, we have Sunday, uh, we continue uh, in our worship and that's at 8 o'clock on Sunday. And then our watch night service is... Uh, will start 9 o'clock on December 31st and um, there will also be a baptism. So let's continue to pray for these services and let's continue to pray one for the other and to really encourage each other in the Lord. God bless you all.